Good morning. Um, can I have your attention? I, I know, if, if this was primary school, I would just say good morning, everybody, and you would say good morning, <laughs> Reverend Lucas, or something like that. I, I don't think we'll try that this morning, but maybe, maybe another time. It's great to welcome you and uh, have you here this morning to gather in Jesus' name to, to praise him, to hear uh, from his word, to have our hearts changed by, by him. And uh, the scriptures tell us it is good to praise him. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's stand, and before we sing, we're going to ask the Lord to open our lips, and we will sing. So do please stand. And let's say this as a response and as a prayer. O oh Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall seated. The Bible tells us that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
For God the Father forgives us in Christ and heals us by the Holy Spirit. So let us put away all bitterness and anger, all slander and malice, and confess our sins to God, our Redeemer. We're going to have the words of a prayer on the screen. And if you just want to have a look at, look at those words for a minute, we'll pray them together. And if you can read, maybe just have a look at a few of the words as we say sorry to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, children, something very exciting now. Mr. German is going to share with us. Oh, here he is. Can I put this? But that's on, isn't it? Is that off? Can I just put this on? Feels like it might explode if that stops ticking. It's a new game. Uh, yes, as Reverend Ben mentioned, my name is Stephen German, but I am British, even if I'm married to a Belgian. <laughs> and I work for Tear Fund. Uh, we work in over 50 countries around the world, amongst the poorest people of the world, where we work wherever possible with local churches, because we believe that God's people, the church, are called to be part of God's response in love and care for people in need. And because we go to some very, very poor churches uh, in different parts of the world, where there isn't much money, they often just hope that they're going to get projects or money or something from us. But we really believe it's important for them to realize that God has given them things as well, that they are not without anything, even though they might not have a lot of money. So there's a story in the Bible about a little boy who thought that he had nothing really worth to bring. Now, this is not the story of the two loaves, two fishes, and two shells, but the story of the two uh, fishes and the five loaves. And Jesus' disciples also said, he's come with these uh, little fish and, and loaves, but what's that amongst so many people? There were thousands of people who were hungry. And another disciple said, it would take someone to work for half a year, half a year's salary, over 12,000 pounds, for people just to get a bite before they go home. But when we give the little things that we do have back to God, he can bless it and multiply it and make it reach very far. And in the story, if you know it in the Bible, Jesus multiplies that bread and it feeds over 5,000 people. The people we work with in churches all around the world use a fun game to help people understand this story that we have often more than we think we've got. It's called The Longest Line, and I'll need some people to help me. There we go. So if, if um, I've actually already asked Ben and Chris to help. If there are a few children who'd like to come, come just come to the front. And Ben and Chris, if you can take them right to the back of the church, and if you can split them up into two teams. I know some of them won't want to be split from one another. There we go. Anyone who wants to come, it should be fun. Give him yeah. Are you speaking? You can join later on okay. in the game if you want. Right. So if you, uh, Chris and Ben, can you split them into two fairly equal groups?
And all that we're asking you to do is to see which of the two teams can make the longest line. Now, you've got to be connected in one way or another. You can use anything you've brought to church with you. And I just got, you've only got one minute and a half to make the longest line, starting right at the back of the church and seeing if you can get to the front. Longest line coming down this way. Okay. No, let's move the slide back, please. Don't give them any ideas. Thank you. I see someone's got a squirrel that might be able to make the line a little bit longer. You might be able to use a belt as long as your trousers don't fall down. Ava, I see you've got a hairband. Do you reckon you can use that to help make the long line? How are we doing? We seem to have got one, one line at the moment. We can only do one line. Okay, this is a turn from competition into cooperation. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> okay. Have we got as far as we can get? Yeah. Oh, look, even even Ben's helping. I did see someone come in this morning who was even taller than Ben, who could have helped. Great, okay, thank you very much everyone for your help. If we'd give them a round of applause. And it's actually quite nice that they did it all together rather than in, in a competition. Would you like to go and grab your seats then? Get back to your seats. And the idea of the game is simply to help people realize that there are lots of things that we do have. And you can see uh, they played the game in a school, uh, I think this was up in Epping, uh, not one of the tier fund programs. Um, and they've used everything they've got to try and make the line longer. And it helps people often in churches to think about all the different things that they do have to help serve others. And it could be things like bicycles, it can be uh, practical things, clothes, it can be money, but it can be other things like friendship, like prayer, like the fact that we have a Bible in our own language, our health, our time. The list is endless when you start to count. And there's a chorus we used to sing when I was a lot younger called Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done and what the Lord has given to you. So, Never think that you come with nothing to God. You, we all have something that we can bring to Jesus. Remember that boy who came with his loaves and fishes. Remember the longest line that's still alive here. And think about what God has given you and come together like that line did, working together to serve people around the world who are in greatest need. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Well, we're going to um, we're going to stand and we're going to sing uh, again. Now, I will enter his gate. So let's stand and sing with gusto.
as we stand, shall we pray for our young people as they leave. Father, we do thank you for uh, the younger members of our congregation. We pray that you would bless them and their Sunday school leaders as they come to, uh, to, to learn from your word. Pray that you would send your spirit on them to soften their hearts, that they might meet you this morning. And the same for us in here as we hear your word uh, read and preached, that we might be changed into the likeness of your son, Jesus. Amen. So if you are small in body, then you may go under the organ pipes. If not, say hello to somebody next to you for a minute. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Can I call you to f do finish these conversations um, over coffee afterwards? Uh, Desiree will read and then Robert will preach. So our reading today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 1 to 15. And this can be found in the Church Bibles on page 1036, but it will also be shown on the screens. After this, this is actually after Jesus had a dinner with, in the house of a Pharisee. So after this, Jesus traveled about from town and village to, to one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the man manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he had said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. 
But the seed on good soil stands for those who are noble, who, who with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, Desiree. Fathers, we now come to look at this parable and think about its meaning and relevance for our lives. We pray by your Holy Spirit that you help us to learn and understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this is a sermon I expect uh, you've heard dozens of times. The parable of the sower occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, I can remember when I was about eight years old, being in Sunday school, coloring in a sheet of paper with the four different types of soil. So this morning, rather than simply just try and go through the parable, I want to sort of stand back a little bit and try and look at the significance of the parable in terms of the wider context of our faith. Now, what the parable is about are the different responses people make when they hear the word of God. And the word of God would be as Jesus taught it. He was teaching the good news of the kingdom. We're told that at the beginning of uh, Luke chapter 8. And... uh, Uh, Jesus was speaking about the good news of the kingdom, and we would understand that in terms of the gospel as the New Testament has presented it to us. And the soil represents the human heart and the different ways in which the human heart responds to the word of God as it is spoken. So we have uh, the pathway where there's no soil, the rocky ground where there's very thin soil that has no moisture, the thorny soil that's... uh, overcome with thorns, and then the good soil that yields a crop. And what is the purpose of this parable? Well, the purpose of this parable is to alert you and say, look, if you are that seed on the pathway that's going to get taken away by a bird of the air very quickly, you need to consider that and uh, be more responsive. Or if you are perhaps a a seed that is sown on the rocky soil, you need to be more responsive and make sure that your heart is much more receptive to the word of God that you are being taught. So the purpose of the parable is that you might be properly responsive to what God is saying to you and teaching you. So today I want to focus more than we might usually do when we talk about this parable on the seed we sow. Now there's great pressure in our world to allow our message to be shaped by our culture. I was quite interested to read yesterday about the Archbishop of York and he was saying that in the Lord's Prayer using our Father was problematic because of uh, the issue of abusive fathers. And we ought to perhaps find a more gender-neutral way of describing God. He spoke about patriarchy. Now, I don't know what you feel about that, but um, you see, what's happening is our culture is wanting to shape what we say and what we believe about what we say. Actually, God has revealed himself as Father. And it's just one small example, if you like, of how our culture wants to redefine what we believe. To the extent that the faith we proclaim uh, ceases to be distinctive. That's the great danger. Very interesting observation of a man called Richard Niebuhr in 1937. I'm grateful to Ben who mentioned this to me on uh, a couple of days ago when we ha- had some time together. And this is an observation of liberal Christianity in America, 1937. And he writes, a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a church without a cross. You see, that's the great danger of trying to um, alter the faith that we have to fit in with the world. We don't redefine God according to the culture of the world. It's God who wishes to reorganize us. 
I wonder if you ever think, well, why is it that we see so little fruit in terms of witness and evangelism? And it's something I experience personally. I've got a very, very wide extended family, almost no Christians in it at all. And it's not for the want of witnessing to our faith. We're living in an age where there does seem to be a lot of stony ground. So I want to speak a little bit about the word of God as we teach it. Which doesn't mean to say that if we teach the gospel correctly, there won't be some times that the word of God or the seed that is sown falls on stony ground. Of course it will. Now, in terms of the New Testament, I just want to draw to your attention three verses that encapsulate the gospel and our response to the gospel. The most famous of which is John 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If ever you want the gospel represented simply and succinctly, that's uh, one of the very best verses in the Bible to remember. And I would fully expect that 90% of the congregation here already know that off by heart. It speaks of the love of God. It speaks of the giving character of God. It speaks of the uniqueness of the Son, the need to believe, the danger of perishing, the promise of eternal life, but the fact that that promise is something that is conditional. So much condensed into one verse. Another verse which... Uh, speaks of the divine exchange, comes from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This verse explains what happened on the cross. Jesus, without sin, perfect, totally pure, took upon himself the sins of the world. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Why does he do that? So that in Jesus, in him, we who are sinful might have the righteousness of God. In other words, the righteousness of Christ is conferred upon us. So the effect of Jesus' death on the cross is that instead of God looking at us as if we're sinful and unclean and to be uh, judged and sent far off, condemned, God instead uh, chooses, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, to see us as if we're righteous. Isn't that amazing? I went on a pastoral visit just a few days ago to an elderly gentleman and he's been bed bound for months and I first of all started talking about heaven and then after a while I just sensed the nudging of the Holy Spirit to talk about forgiveness and he said to me how important it was that he could feel forgiven because he was aware of so much that he had done wrong in his life. Well, we know that can happen because God makes us the righteousness of God. And then in terms of our response, Acts uh, chapter 2, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This, of course, comes from the day of Pentecost, and it speaks of our response. We're called to repent and be baptized, we're to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The purpose that lies behind that is the forgiveness of our sins. And then, of course, something that is vital to Christian living is the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And Peter says, look, that's the promise for you and for those who are far off. And there are hundreds of other verses, in fact, the whole scriptures that speak of the gospel. The more you study the Bible, the more you realize that its entirety from start to finish is all pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ and is all focusing on the gospel. But if from those three verses I had to summarize the gospel in essence, this is just my own understanding of how I think these three verses point to the gospel. And this is how I would put it. Maybe you might put it slightly differently. God, who is both holy 
and loving, gave his only son Jesus into our world to die for our sins in our place once and for all, paying the penalty we should have paid so that we might be forgiven. God raised Jesus to life, showing that we also can have eternal life and through the Spirit to know him now. We are called to repent, believe, and to be baptized. So that's how I uh, would distill the gospel in just uh, a few sentences. Now, why am I stressing this so much? I think it's because in the church today, we are missing the mark so easily, and I'm going to give you some examples. Um, Recently, I've been to two diocesan events. One was the institution of a vicar, another was a service for Church of England schools. And they were both fantastic services. And the sermon was great, but I just felt that in each case, uh, the sermon missed the mark. And this is why. The first sermon I heard was, God is on your side. God is for you. God is love. Uh, God wants the best for you. That was the sermon. And of course, all that is true. But there's an important caveat, isn't there? God is also holy, who hates sin. And actually, there's a problem until our sins are forgiven. We're not to have the presumption that our sins are forgiven. Jesus, all over the place, calls us to repent. Repent and believe. The kingdom of God is at hand. That was the message of John the Baptist, and it's the message that Jesus also took up. God is on our side. Yes, of course, we rejoice in that. And it's on account of that that he sent his son into the world. But he didn't send send his son into the world for us to be indifferent to the son, but to respond to the son, and that's through believing, through faith, and critically through Repentance. Another example. Many churches in our land want to be really inclusive of everything and everyone. And uh, this is happening very broadly. And the particular theme that one hears very often is this. Love is love. And In many ways, this is exactly right, that whatever our circumstances, whatever our background, wherever we're coming from, whatever situation we find ourselves in, uh, the love of God is generous and accepting. And in some measure, that is true. However, God has also placed boundaries which must not be crossed. And if we cross those boundaries, it's defined as sin, And it's that sin from which we need to be forgiven. Give you an example, the Ten Commandments. The the Ten Commandments set ten boundaries. There's only uh, one God who we should worship. No graven image should we make. We we shan't steal. We shan't uh, commit adultery. All these things. These are ten boundaries that God has placed. And of course, uh, most of us break most of them all the time. In fact, I would say all of us break all of them all the time. And we need God's forgiveness. So if we teach that love is love without also teaching the need for repentance and forgiveness, um, then we're missing the mark. And for this last one, I, again, thank Ben very much for, because uh, when we were having lunch together, he reminded me of this one. And it's, uh, God will restore you from your brokenness and hurt. And of course, that is true. And uh, there are many churches, not least this one, and I've preached this myself. But it's not the totality of God's message. God will restore us from our brokenness and hurt, certainly. But forgiveness is paramount. Do you remember the story of the man who was lowered through the roof? who um, comes to the feet of Jesus. He's a a paralytic. And do you remember the first thing that Jesus says to him? He says, son, your sins are forgiven. 
And there must have been a sense, well, that's not why I've come. Jesus then goes on to say, but to show that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I also say to you, get up and walk. And the man gets up and walks. Of course, we pray that God will restore us from our brokenness and hurt. But foundational to that is the forgiveness of sins. So our culture um, will often want to belittle, write out, airbrush, reference to sin, the need for forgiveness of sin, repentance, and the need for repentance. It'll want to airbrush that out. But the gospel must include that. Now let me uh, move on and talk about the effects of sowing and the four responses. Now, I'm not going to try and explain this in detail, but just simply give you four examples of the way I've observed this parable in practice. The first one, the pathway. Um, Mary and I have a number of brothers. We took two of them on one occasion to hear Billy Graham speak in Liverpool. I was working as a school teacher at the time in Liverpool. It's a long time ago. And we took two brothers to hear Billy Graham, Anfield Road Football Stadium. And at the end of the meeting, they were both very taken with what was said. Went down, filled out the cards. So with great excitement, we uh, went and saw each one afterwards. But uh, very sadly, they'd lost all interest. They said, oh, I think it was just a bit emotional. I got a bit carried away. And uh, nothing resulted from that sowing of the word. They heard it, but they've not responded. Of course, we pray. What about the rocky soil? And again, this is a, an experience I know very closely. A student who comes to faith uh, a little bit before going to university, goes to university and finds the fellow students hostile. Her fellow students are all into uh, clubbing, dancing, having a good, good time, and Christianity doesn't figure. And the student gets waylaid, can't cope with being a Christian with the hostile atmosphere that other students have, and uh, abandons her faith. Now, uh, I think the sense of this parable is if you recognize that happening in your life, then take stock. And very happily, uh, the particular person I'm thinking of did just that eventually, for which I'm enormously grateful. What about the thorny soil? There's a dad. His son loves football. Unfortunately, the football's on a Sunday morning. He takes the... Uh, his lad to Sunday morning football. They're finding it hard to make ends meet. Mum goes out to work. They're having to get carers in or make arrangements for children being looked after before they get back from work. Life becomes enormously busy. Church gets squeezed out. Each day requires a very early start. Personal devotions get squeezed out. And eventually, the fact that uh, they were church members, little by little, seems to have got uh, squeezed out by all the pressures of life. That's the thorny soil. What about the good soil? Well, this is where a person hears the word of God, is productive, involved in ministry, and mission. When I was a vicar in Nottingham, I had a terribly difficult youth group. They just would not behave. And uh, anyway, I selected two or three out of them for, uh, to do a little Bible study with. Three lads. And we worked through uh, Mark's Gospel. We worked through Philippians. There were 13, 14, these three lads. Spent ages with them. One of them uh, became a youth worker in South Africa. 
committed Christian, uh, is absolutely dedicated in his life to the work of God. I rejoice greatly. Hallelujah for what he does. He puts YouTube videos up of some of the talks he does, working hard for the Lord. You see, that's the good soil. People who are generous with their time, their talents, their resources, and who become an example to others of what it means to be a Christian. And let me now move on to the challenge I think we face. First and foremost, we must be a church of prayer. Because if we want to see much good soil and much turning in the life of the church uh, to the Lord Jesus, then we must be a church of prayer. All that I've been speaking of thus far in terms of proclaiming the word, uh, praying that soil is receptive to the seed, must be birthed in prayer. Do take seriously our, our monthly prayer meeting, first Wednesday of the month. Do log in to that. Do take seriously the praying for our missionaries. We had a missionary prayer meeting at half past eight. It's the second Saturday of every month, half past eight in the hall. Do take prayer seriously in your home groups as you pray for your life as a group of people together. But just don't pray for your problems. Pray also for the mission and ministry of God's work in this place. On Building on that prayer, we are to build bridges and to be involved in the community. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, we're not just a church just to comfort and reassure ourselves and give ourselves a pat on the back. We're to find ways of building bridges with the community around us. An example of, of that was the fun day that we had in the middle of June. Great example. And we're to be involved in the community where we are part of. So don't just join church things. Somebody once said to me, oh Robert, now I've become a Christian, I'll give up all the things I'm involved with and come and join in the things that the church is doing. I said, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Stay in the things that you're involved in in your community. We must nurture relationships and open doors. Uh, we're looking forward to Starship Discovery, aren't we, quite soon? What a wonderful opportunity this is to build bridges with our community. We're going to be having 100 children in our midst. We will be meeting their parents. The vast majority of these children are not from church families. Uh, we'll be sharing the essentials of the life of Peter and uh, Peter's witness to the Lord Jesus in that holiday club. These children will be talking to their parents about what they're doing. And we'll have a barbecue at the end of it. We'll have opportunities to connect with the parents when they drop the children off and when they go home. What an amazing opportunity that is to build relationships, build bridges, and be involved in our community. In our home groups, in our church life, our teaching must always be Jesus-focused and gospel-focused. We're not to talk about morality exclusively, though that is important. But the uh, full counsel of God, which includes the gospel uh, that I've been speaking of. When we make contacts with people, we're to find ways in which we can then help these people discover more. So courses like Alpha and Christianity Explored. I know a number of you are here today on account of being on Christianity Explored courses or Alpha courses. When we make relationships, when we um, hear teaching, uh, we think, how can we connect these people to Christianity Explored or Alpha or other similar type courses? And then it's tempting to think, well, all of that is the responsibility of the vicar and the curate, and maybe one or two retired clergy who happen to be about and the staff team, it's the responsibility of all of us. It's the whole body of Christ. We need the help of everybody in this context to work together to bring the gospel to the world that doesn't know it. And God will give you unique gifts 
Uh, it may be that you are a very outgoing personality who establish friendships easily. It comes naturally to you. You've got a good circle of friends. You see, that's the particular gift God may have given you. But he then wants you to use that uh, for the purposes of the kingdom. It may be that you're very good at explaining things. God may want to use you on an alpha course. You see, God gives us all gifts. He wants us all personally involved. By the grace of God, I'm getting to know a group of people outside the church at the moment, and I'm praying uh, that the Lord might show me how I can uh, draw them to the kingdom. Maybe the same situation is facing you. We want to sow God's word, and we want to look with expectancy to that rich harvest. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, show each one of us how we can be involved in sowing the word and how we as a church can, with increasing effectiveness, sow that word. And we look for a rich harvest. And then there may be some of us who realize that our hearts are a little bit like that rocky soil or a little bit like that thorny soil or even a little bit like that pathway. Things just pass us by. And we want to say, Lord, uh, we repent of our hard-heartedness Grant us by your grace a heart that is open and receptive to the word of God. Amen. Thank you, Robert. Well, as we respond uh, to that message, we're going to sing, uh, sing our next hymn, Come Behold the Wondrous Stories. Let's stand and sing in response.
do be seated. Well, it is my privilege to publish uh, two sets of bands of marriage. The band of marriage between Samuel Peter Jukes, single of this parish, and Amy Elizabeth Bigwood, single of All Saints Waldron with Cross in Hand. This is for the second time of asking. Also between Ben Oliver, single of this parish, and Danielle Mariner, also single of this parish. This is for the first time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it to me afterwards. That would be great. Should we pray for them? Father, we do thank you for the gift of marriage, for the image it gives of your love for the church. We pray for Samuel, Amy, Ben, and Danielle as they prepare for their weddings. I pray that they wouldn't be overwhelmed by preparation and stress, but that they would enjoy the day and that they would come to know you as the center of their marriage. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'll ask Fernando now to give a, me- a, a, a notice. Hi, good morning. This notice is for the ladies. Um, we are having a picnic on the 2nd of August. That's going to be in the rectory garden. It starts at 6.30 and finishes at 9 o'clock. It is free, so you need to go on the website and, and just put your name down so we know how many of you are coming so we can set up chairs and tables for the day. This is going to be the day we're celebrating what God has done in the ministry of the women in St. Margaret's this past year and also look forward to what uh, God is going to be doing next year. And because of that, we've uh, made a card, thanks to lovely Leanne who prepared this for us. It's on the table and has dates for your diary, so you can plan ahead, and there's no excuse for them not showing up for any of the events, because you've planned, you put it on your diary. So, yes, please pick one on your way out, and be inviting people to come to the picnic as well. And any questions about that, come and talk to me after the service. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Fernanda. In a moment, Steve's going to come and share some more things. You're expecting that? Yes? Good. Um, And (laughs) about Tear Fund, um, just to say that our giving today will be for Tear Fund. So if you put any money in the plate or if you scan anything on the card, it's going to be for Tear Fund. So do bear that in mind and be generous, um, if you will, Steve. and get the doggy thing this time, speak into this. Great, thanks very much, Robert, for what you shared earlier. Um, uh, I've been with Tear Fund for about uh, 25 years. Um, Most of that was with Desiree and our children working overseas in different parts of Africa. But my role is now in Teddington, and uh, I support our global church teams around the world, looking at building partnerships uh, with like-minded organizations who also want to work with the church. At Tier Fund, what we uh, do, we call integral mission. It's not really anything new, but it just wants to emphasize that there is no area of our lives, a bit as Robert was saying earlier, in business, in school, in politics, at home, in front of the television, in the running clubs, swimming clubs, rugby clubs, where Jesus doesn't claim lordship. So who is Tear Fund? Uh, That's kind of the sort of statement you will see on our website, um, that we're working with over 50 countries, in over 50 countries, with a primary focus on supporting people in poverty, trying to bring people out of extreme poverty, advocating for them. We do a lot of advocacy work and providing disaster relief um, in different circumstances. So like in the flooding in Pakistan um, and in the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Uh, And as we were sharing on Wednesday night in the prayer meeting, trying to respond in the different countries where we have staff to the 20 odd million people who are uh, suffering extreme hunger in East Africa at this time. Uh, We do still continue to do uh, basic uh, crisis response, uh, water and sanitation work, livelihoods, projects. Uh, But more and more, we're seeking to work 
with others. And I think actually the children gave us a great example this morning that the reach uh, that they could gain by working together was so much more than each of them could have done uh, separate lines. And we're increasingly uh, working with the church um, in all of its forms, uh, in local churches, denominations, theological colleges, Christian networks, and we're looking to increase that by tenfold. We're working with about 25,000 churches at the moment, uh, and we're looking to extend that to 250,000 in the next seven years. Why do we work with the church? Why does TFM work with the church? Just click again. There's, there's a number of good reasons you could probably think through yourself. One, they're a trusted voice in the community. People go to the church when there are issues. Uh, it has a voice and an influence, perhaps less so in the UK uh, these days, but around the world, the church has voice and influence. It has its own resources, its buildings, its people who are trained. It has reach, it has presence. It's also made up of those who are extremely poor themselves, and they are the poor serving the poor uh, and marginalized people. They're local and they're embedded all around the world. Why does TFM work with the church? Well, we have a whole history of over 50 years of working and supporting churches around the world, and so we have some great relationships. And there is a strong mission overlap with what God calls the church to do and what Tear Fund is seeking to do, showing the love of God in very practical ways. And those local churches are contextualized. They preach the gospel in their languages with their own cultural understanding in a way that it's difficult for people coming from outside to do so. So in many ways, there are practical reasons for why we work with the church, but there's theological reasons in that the church is God's plan A, and God doesn't have a plan B. I just have a little video clip. I've got to apologize if there are any adverts that come up with it. I've already been told that's my responsibility. Um, it's a one minute, you may have already seen uh, as part of our funding campaign about uh, some of the work we've been involved in in Burundi. It's just one minute long. Um, I love that little clip. I think uh, that really picks up particularly the area of work that I'm involved in uh, and just kind of try to capture that in this uh, three elements, that input, your funding, your prayers, your support and the other funding that comes into Tier Fund is the input that comes to us at Tier Fund and enables us to do the output, providing resources, providing training, capacity building of churches and partners being able to respond to crises around the world. And the outcome, which is really important, is this life, whole life transformation. Uh, Robert picked up on the verse John 3.16, which we all know, and we love to see people's lives being transformed as they discover who Jesus is and that their lives become transformed. But there are other verses in the Bible um, such as Deuteronomy 15, which perhaps most of you won't be able to quote, uh, and uh, was preached at last Sunday when we were in a church of Wales, in Wales. And it says basically that uh, every seventh year you are to release people from their debt. 
And, and the minister went on to say, well, that's really a picture of Jesus forgiving us our debt of sin. And yes, that may be so, but it also does mean what it says, that those debts are meant to be resolved, uh, that we must not be keeping countries around the world in debt. God doesn't want to exceed extreme poverty or extreme wealth. Or the other verse, um, Proverbs 11, 1. The Lord detests the use of dishonest scales. When Ziziri was teaching Bible in Congo when we were there, the students said, well, that doesn't mean what it says. It's, it's, it's got to be spiritualized. It means God doesn't like us to use wrong words or something. But no, it means what it says. God is interested in how we do business if we are doing it justly, if we're cheating people. All those things are important to God. And even that last verse there, Proverbs 12.10, is about how we treat our animals. God is interested in every area of our life. So let me just, um, sorry, and then those last two verses, um, Isaiah 26.12 uh, and John 15.5, remind us at the end of the day, it's not tear fund doing the work. It's even though we use all our skills and whatever we have, but it's God. Everything we have done, you have accomplished for us, is what uh, it says in Isaiah 26. And John 15 says, without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. So just let me finish with a, a, a final s slide of a very practical example. I don't know if you can see that there. But uh, this is something that was shown to us uh, when we were in a little village in Uganda after a, a man and wife had uh, been through one of the training courses and they wanted to show us this picture that they'd drawn on an old sack of maize. And it was basically, as they'd heard uh, God's word being taught, they realized that their life had, be, had to change. And uh, on the left-hand side is uh, their past life, what the wife was doing, and on this side, what the man was doing. And on the top are some of their hopes for their lives moving forward. And as they'd studied uh, and, and changed, um, I can't remember all the symbols and signs of what it's saying, but on the right-hand side, you see the man uh, with the picture. He, he realized, and he shared with us, I was going every evening to watch sports down at the bar, uh, spending a lot of the family money on alcohol, and other things, and I realize that's got to change because God wants me to live a different way of life. And the other thing he said was, we suddenly realize that God's word speaks to us today, so we've decided to buy a Bible that we can read together. So thank you for listening this morning. Thank you for your support for Tear Fund, your prayerful and financial support, because I do believe that together, with God's help, we are making a difference. There is um, a behind-the-scenes uh, video of uh, the Burundi, which is quite fun, but we won't watch that now. We've run out of time. Um, but if you want to uh, find that link, I'll share it with you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, so much to, to pray about and think about. We're going to respond to that in the words of our next hymn, I Will Offer Up My Life. Really a prayer that we offering ourselves, isn't it? Change offers starts with ourselves, doesn't it? So let's sing, I will offer up my life.
David will lead us in prayer. I've often said this when I've been asked to pray. I believe that prayer is the most powerful thing in the whole wide world. And we've been given plenty of information, plenty of cues to really get down to prayer this week from the word which was preached to the information about tear funds. I think I would like to begin with tear fund. Um, I know time is running out, but I don't want to rush too much. The thing which is so important is to remember that Desiree is in a week or so's time traveling out somewhere, and at the end of the month, Steve is also. So they're very committed to their mission and what they are involved in. And we have seen what Tear Fund does. And so I bring this prayer, which comes from the prayer diary for this month. A prayer for the hungry from Tear Fund. Dear God, just as you provided manna in the desert for the Israelites, please provide nourishing food for who, all who need it. Let no one go hungry. Bless the crops in the ground so the harvest will be plentiful again. Where people are sick from hunger or malnutrition, heal and comfort them. Amen. We can be a part of that, as we've already seen, by giving. Not only praying, but giving. We live in a very, very confused world. A sinful world. Everyone seems to be doing that which is right in their own eyes. So many are drifting aimlessly through life rather than, rather like a boat with no rudder. Grant, Father God, your spirit will bring revival to this land where men and women once again will seek the face of God and understand what it means when they celebrate Easter, Jesus died on the cross so that they could be forgiven of their sins and Christ would give them a purpose in their lives. Revival in our day where all will gain a God-centered purpose for their lives. That is what I pray for, and I've prayed for many, many years. In fact, virtually the whole of my Christian life, when I came to faith at nearly 70, 17 years of age. We pray to this end that in every pulpit there will be men who know Christ as Saviour and Lord and women, should I say, and will lead the people into truth. Remove the weeds, I pray, Father God, and bring a deep awareness of your powerful presence in your church. I pray that, of course, of our own church, that there will be an even greater sense of the powerful presence of Christ in the midst. We pray for Eden, Florence, and their father Nick on the anniversary of their baptism. Beginnings. We need to see Father God them growing on. So we pray, Father God, that you would lead and guide them, that they will come to faith, that they will grow in faith, and they will be inspired even though sometimes the way may be hard and difficult. So, so Margaret's school has a, a residential uh, trip coming up very shortly. In fact, I think it starts tomorrow. 
uh, a residential break at Codner Sailing Center in which Chris Wilson, our youth pastor, will be involved. Pray, Father God, that there will be a very safe, successful time for St. Margaret's School. The children will have a great time, learn much, but also as Chris takes them through some things about faith and trust in Christ, that, Lord, many will start to think of eternal things. We think of Ben and Emily, who will be leaving us very shortly to take up their new post in Linfield. Father God, we pray so much that everything will slot into place accommodation, schools, absolutely everything we pray, Lord Jesus. The time is short, but we pray so much for the blessing on them, for the power of Holy Spirit to grab hold of them and use them in their new place of service. For Jesus' sake we pray it. We thank Father God of all of the things we are involved in Christians Against Poverty, the Family Support um, Group, and for Holiday Club. Holiday Club is coming on very, very sh soon. So we really do pray, Father God, again, for safety, for security, and for a tremendous blessing to all involved, and that the youngsters will take home something which is of great a vital use to them and that is a sense that Jesus loves them deeply and wants them to walk in his ways. He wants them to be truly blessed and encouraged as they do so. So thank you Father for your goodness and your kindness in supplying our need. I testify to the fact that over 60 years of endeavouring to walk with God. There have been times, many times, when I've failed and I've found it hard. But God has always enabled me to walk through and to come out rejoicing. So as we think of so much that is negative in our world going on, so much that is longing to press the church and us personally into the mould of the world. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd help us as a church and as people of God to stand firm and say absolutely no. We will walk and with God. We will keep our eyes firmly fixed on him. That is what I pray. Lord Jesus, help us to continue our walk of faith in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Thank you, David. Well, as we, as we close, we are going to address ourselves. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. So do stand and let's sing.
stay standing. Do join us for coffee afterwards and remember that giving is for Tear Fund. God the Holy Trinity, make us strong in faith and love. Defend us on every side and guide us in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.